Hello, so here I have two JVC monitors that I picked up approximately a year ago. On the left we have the TMH1900G and on the right the TMH1750CG made in 2006 and 2004 respectively. Both of these are 750 TV line professional video monitors featuring TriDot CRTs. Aside from the slight size disparity, the main differences between the two of these is where, where the 19-inch 1900 only offers composite or S-video input. The 1750 allows for additional input cards, for such as SDI input, but more importantly, RGB and component input cards, be those official or clone. As you may have noticed, these two monitors look quite similar, and that's because they're from the same series. The 1900 is a 1700, and the 1750 has a 1950. The major differences between the two of these is that the daughter boards required for the inputs aren't fully populated on the 1900 and 1700 models. They are also missing the additional daughter board required to support the input card, as well as a less populated front button panel for actually switching the set inputs. Now, neither of these two monitors are in immaculate condition. The 1900 had a very bad time in shipping, resulting in the front fascia being completely torn off and shearing several bolts. Despite this, it still functions absolutely perfectly and displays a pristine image. The 1750, on the other hand, though not receiving any damage in shipping, has some faults with its image. It is bright, it's vibrant, and it's well focused. However, I believe in its previous life it was used for some type of video production where they required widescreen. As along the top of the tube, there is a distinct line of burn-in, which I sus suspect is from 16x9 video. If you were to be using this monitor for that, it would be absolutely fine. You likely would not notice it one bit. However, for this type of systems that we want to use with these sort of monitors, it would stick out like a sore thumb. It's full screen, 240p, maybe 480i. There'd be no avoiding it. The original plan for this video was to attempt a tube swap, as in researching them, it came to my attention that between the 17 and the 19 inch models, Nearly all of the components on each of the main boards was exactly the same, from the flyback to power section to the daughter boards, of course. However, as this research went on, it occurred to me that that simply isn't necessary. All that I need to do is to take the daughter boards from the 1750, which allow for the input cards, and swap them for the daughter boards in the 1900 making it a 1950. Whether this will work or not, we will soon find out. So, Cat here. Originally, I had intended for this video to be all live audio, but due to a number of problems ranging from background noise, volume, and balancing, to editing and simple length issues, I came to the decision that a redub was the best way to handle things. With that out of the way, let's get to the actual video. To begin, let's get to work on disassembling the 1900. As you can see, it has already been partially taken apart, and there is a very good reason for this. Part of the shipping damage I mentioned earlier included multiple sheared screws responsible for holding this outside case on. In order to check to make sure that none of the PCBs had been damaged, and to see as to whether it was safe to attempt powering on, I needed to get inside. This ended up requiring an hour or so of dremeling off heads and cutting into threads for the screws to even consider releasing. All that said, if you're starting on an undamaged monitor, it's nothing complicated. Not really a lot more to say aside from that you really don't want to apply too much pressure to this back panel while removing it as doing so will lead to the main board and the input board being flexed a little bit. 
once you've got all of these screws removed, the backplate should just pull away. Here is a little close-up of the daughter board we're after. To get it out, we'll first need to undo this video cable leading to the neck board, the actual connectors going to the main board, and the AC inlet. First things first, remove this wire running into the top of the input daughter board. In the live cut, I'd originally referred to this as a D-guise wire, but I now believe that it may potentially be used for landing adjustments. It is in a 3-pin connector, but with only two wires populated. The vacant spot should be facing the rear of the set. From here, we want to remove the cable feeding video signals, RGB, over to the neck board for final amplification. To do this, we'll first have to remove the neck board. The best way I have found to do this is to slowly rock it side to side, walking it backwards until it releases. To protect the pins on the neck from damage, it's usually a smart idea to replace the neck board, at least partially, until you need to fuss with it again. With that cable disconnected, the only thing still keeping the input board connected to the main board is this AC connector and a single screw. You sadly aren't able to see it from this angle, but the connectors holding the daughter board in place are latched. If you'll note these small bumps, these are what hold the board in place. To release them, you simply need to apply a bit of outward pressure and the connector will give way. Now, we will begin work on the 1750CG, repeating the same general steps that we'd previously performed on the 1900. The screws here would seem to be holding a bit tighter than those on the 1900, which I can only assume is from the rough handling the latter received in shipping. I should have mentioned this earlier, but the screws on the input panel itself do not need to be removed. They're simply there to hold this panel to the daughter board, not to the rear plate. With this back panel removed, the second daughter board is now exposed. A nice boxy design, I like that. One thing to remember when replacing a neck board, you do want to be sure to apply pressure evenly so as not to crack the PCB. While repairable, you really don't want to spend an hour trying to work out as to why you've lost green entirely as I have in the past. While I originally did so here, it would be better to leave the neck board off for now, if only to give ourselves a bit more room to work with in unlatching the connectors going down to the main board. The box for holding the input cards obstructs access a bit compared to the models without it. A flathead screwdriver, or simply a flat prying tool of some sort, will aid in undoing said latches.
I'm going to leave this here, for posterity's sake. But upon first inspection, I had assumed I would need to remove the bezel to gain access to the PCB for the front buttons, which we will need. When starting on undoing the second top screw, a few cracking sounds came from the plastic, which I believe may be related to an issue that we will run into momentarily. It is entirely possible that removing the front bezel is the proper way to remove this board, but given that it is actually part of the support, or at least responsible for painting the tube itself, I wouldn't recommend removing it unless absolutely necessary. This little speaker here isn't actually held in by any screws or latches, and is simply wedged into place. On an unrelated note, for how tinny the speakers are on Sony monitors, the ones on these JVCs are actually rather nice for the size. While in hindsight I absolutely recommend doing so, I hadn't planned on discharging the tube on this set as it hadn't been powered on in several months. I opted to do so when I came to the realization that the boards would need to be pulled clear in order to remove the front buttons. I'm also going to leave this bit of fumbling around in so that none of you run into the pitfalls that I did. The metal base on this monitor has a few risers on it for supporting this tray, but they also seem to like to catch and make removing said tray more difficult. Additionally, the buttons on the front PCB repeatedly caught on the degaussing wire. To get said front PCB to release, there are three plastic clips that hold down the board and in place. Undo them and push the board forward and it will slide out from a pair of guides. With that, we could just leave this monitor as is, but I do want to have a functioning 1700 at the end of this. As such, I'm going to be placing the front PCB from 1900 into it as well. You do want to make sure to swap out these two ribbon cables, as the 19-inch model does require the additional length. If you compare the two boards side by side, they are the one and the same, just one is more populated than the other. When swapping these two cables, you want to make sure that the flat portion of it goes into the front PCB and the folded portion goes to the main board. While this isn't for a high-speed laser assembly or anything like that, be careful not to needlessly bend or fold it any further than it already is. Remember how I had previously mentioned that bit of plastic cracking? Well, either when undoing that screw or simply in shipping, it would seem a bit of plastic broke off and landed up right where our front PCB needs to go. This repeatedly slipped into the plastic around the power switch, which is why you can see me repeatedly pulling and prodding at it. I eventually grabbed a small claw tool to grab the piece of plastic and pull it out. From there, it was simply a matter of lifting the tray slightly to make it over the risers in the metal, and getting it past the degaussing coil, and it slipped right back into place. If improperly, the plastic tray should be resting entirely within the metal base, and the buttons on the front should give an obvious clicking sound of them properly triggering. Before going any further, make sure to replace all of the connectors that needed to be undone in order to get the tray out, including the grounding lug to the neck board, degauss connector to the main board, and of course the high voltage cable. Do make sure that both hooks are properly engaged into the anode cup. With all this done, there's not a whole lot left to do. Replace the daughter board from the other monitor, being sure to line up well with the connectors on the main board as well as applying pressure evenly so it seats level. You should hear a firm click when they engage. From here, you want to make sure to reattach the landing and tally wires to their correct positions. Additionally, you must remember to reattach the AC inlet connector as well as the video lines to the neck board. Now, 
in theory this monitor should function as a 1700. I could go ahead and begin reassembling the 19 inch model as well, but for all I know this board swap could have failed outright and I'd simply be wasting my time doing something that would need to be undone later. As such I'm going to power this one up first and see what happens. To test it out, I've chosen to use this PS2 over S-Video. The little yellow light on the front is a good sign that we haven't explicitly broken anything outright. The game of choice is Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle, a game which just celebrated its 21st birthday. Do note, we still have these cutouts here for the other buttons. We could fashion something to cover these, but I don't really see that as necessary right now. So it has turned on, and I do hear the 15kHz whine. That's good. The menu showing up here should be enough to tell us that the daughter board swap has been a success as it contains all the circuitry required to generate that. However, just as a sanity check, let's turn on the PS2 and find out. The reason I'm fiddling with the volume here is that I'd accidentally connected the audio to the composite input rather than that of the S-Video. Now, this looks considerably dimmer and less vibrant in person than the camera is likely making it out to seem. This could be due to service menu settings which likely carried over from the 1900, but I do remember that this set wasn't as bright when I had initially tested it either. A little tweak to the flyback works in a pinch, but I will need to fiddle with the individual cutoff and gain controls later to get it looking a bit more proper. At this point, if you don't care to see me perform these exact same steps in the 1900, you can skip to the 18 minute 50 second mark to see the results. Otherwise, please continue watching. Now, the 1900, now 1950, is reassembled and as you can see from the power LED, we haven't fried the electronics on this one either. This also gives you a good view of all the buttons which previously belonged to the 17 inch model, now here for the 19 inch to use. Without further delay, let's power it on. There goes the degauss, and wine, and here's our menu. Composite, S-Video, and the two currently unconnected channels for the input cards. Now, when we switch to these and check the menu, you see it is now displaying component level as a setting for these inputs. This shows that the monitor now believes, rightfully so, that it is a 1950.
Now, again, just to double check that everything is working, a bit of actual video. And there you have it. With this confirmation, I believe that we can say this experiment has indeed been a success. Where we previously had a great condition tube stuck with lower quality inputs, and a worn monitor with higher quality inputs, we've now ended up with two perfectly usable and more appropriately equipped sets. Now, just to get a hold of an RGB and component input card to give it a proper shakedown. I know this video is a tad different to what I usually do, and don't worry, I do plan to upload a companion piece to this showing it off in much nicer quality, but assuming this is well received, I'd like to do more videos of this nature in the future.
drop a like, sub, or even just a comment below to let me know what you think. Oh, and one last thing. Down in the bottom left, as well as in the description, you'll find a link to my CRT Discord server, as well as one to my coffee page if you'd like to throw a bit of support my way. The ones on screen aren't clickable, so you'll have to type them in manually or just hit up the description. With that, I'd like to wish you all a Happy New Year and a fantastic 2019.